Welcome to episode 285 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on May 20th, 2022. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss the topic or recent news and how it relates to you. Today, we follow up with a few more updates on modern authentication support for Exchange Online when it comes to public folder migration and PowerShell modules. We also discuss Microsoft Learn Collections and a new CMMC collection that Microsoft created. Finally, we close out the show, spending some time talking about the new Outlook for Windows client and why we probably won't be using it anytime soon. Scott, Ben, it's Friday. <laughs> it's always Friday. <laughs> this is not always Friday. Yesterday was not Friday. But we are both in our beach attire. We are in hats. And would you like to know on this wonderful Friday where I store my dad jokes? Sure. In a dad a base. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty bad. We got to move on quickly from that. Move on to what? Do you have a better dad joke for me? <laughs> <laughs> I do not. Not off the top of my head. I had one the other day that I told my daughter. What rhymes with orange? I don't know. What rhymes with orange? No, it doesn't. What does not rhyme with orange? <laughs> are they getting worse? Uh, uh, yes, they are. <laughs> You're devolving quickly. All right. So should we move on from corny dad jokes into cloud news? Yes, Because let's do you it. have meetings. It's the end of the Friday. We're doing it a little later because I was gone. And there's a little news. It is coming up to build. Build is next week. By the time this episode goes live, build will have been in the past. But there's still some news to talk about. What news would you like to talk about? Would you like to talk about the one everybody's been talking about over the last week or two? Because it kind of leaked and then it came out. Uh, Well, I think a couple pieces of follow-up, maybe just real quick to get them out of the way. Okay. So in the episode that came out prior to this one, we had a discussion around the deprecation of basic authentication in Exchange Online. Yeah. And with that coming, you know, there's all sorts of things you need to think about with PowerShell modules, potentially how you manage things, how clients are coming through, blah, 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 all that good stuff. There's been a couple of kind of helper articles and knowledge base articles that have come out since then that can potentially help you accelerate that migration depending on what you're doing. And one of them I hadn't even really thought about. And that was public folder migrations. Unfortunately, I've done a lot of public folder migrations in the past. It's not something that I'm happy to admit. It's super painful. They suck. I don't know why people still use them. I mean, I do, but I don't. Anywho, if you were doing those migrations previously, you were potentially caught on legacy authentication mechanisms. There are now a set of scripts out there that allow for public folder migration with modern authentication support. So everything from being able to set folder properties, lock, unlock folder properties, perform synchronizations between between public folders on premises and that exist in Exchange Online. So I thought that was super good to get out in the world and see it available for everybody. I agree. I think there's a lot of things that are going to come up over the next six months. So I would keep an eye on blog posts, keep an eye on different sources, because I think there's a lot of things like that that are just going to pop up and people are going to be like, oh, I didn't Think of that with the whole transition from basic auth to modern auth. I saw an article, and I lost it, where it actually looked to at the different exchange modules. So you have like the the remote PowerShell to manage exchange. You have an exchange online PowerShell module V1. You have a V2, and then you have a V2 preview. And it went through each one and kind of what backs each one how the different ones work with modern auth versus basic auth, if you have PowerShell scripts running, which versions of these modules you want to be on, as well as kind of the plan for these modules going forward. So I don't have it to throw in the chat for this episode. Did you find it? I already put it, I put it there for you because, yeah, I'm a, I'm a nice person. I'm gonna say it'll be in the show notes because I know I can go back and find it again. I just didn't have it in front of me. But <laughs> those two articles I both saw after, <laughs> sorry, Scott's construction caught me off guard there. Those two articles both are going to deal with that whole basic to modern auth switch. 
Sound like you have cicadas in your office. <laughs> cicadas? Cicadas. You know, little bugs that make... Yeah. At least coming over the mic, it did. No, there's no cicadas in here. Sorry. No, it was definitely construction. I think. Is that what that noise was? It could be one of my dogs sitting behind me chewing a dog bone. Oh, but... all right. Anyways. Oh, well. And it's anyway, Friday. As you said, there are more resources coming which can help you deal with things like this wonderful transition that everybody is going through in Exchange Online. It'll be super, super fun to see if it gets delayed once again for some reason. Should we take bets on if it's going to get delayed or not? No, I'm over on betting on things after global pandemics. (laughs) That was the last one I didn't have on my card, so (laughs) I'm out after that. It's been delayed several times. I'm going to guess they're going to stick with this one. I can see where people might make an argument for delaying it, but I'm going to go with they're going to stick to this one. I'm curious to see when the basic auth for SMTP auth goes away. Like, are they ever going to be able to get rid of that? Or is that one that's going to just live forever due to a lot of those multifunction devices? There's going to be so many faxes and printers that are hurt by that one. That there will be, most definitely. Although you would think they could update the firmware and do the whole device auth thing where it's like, go to microsoft.com slash device and type in a code and I don't know. Probably easier said than done. Probably. Uh, So what else was there since last week? Well, before we hopped on, you were extolling the virtues of CMMC training to me. I was. So that was another one that I saw that you care nothing about. But we have talked about some of the CMMC compliance and setting up certain regulations and configuring Office 365 a certain way. And this article popped up that Microsoft Learn for CMMC is now available. So this is... I mean, the article goes into how many people estimated companies affected by CMMC, how many people require third-party audits, all of that type of stuff. But there is now an article and a learn module that has been put together that is a curated collection on getting started with Microsoft for CMMC. So if you want to, if you're in that boat where... You have to deal with CMMC. You need to make sure all your Microsoft Cloud stuff is configured for CMMC. This might be something that you want to go check out and see if there's anything that you haven't thought about, that you're missing, that you can learn from this. And there is a short link for it, aka.ms slash CMMC. Takes you over to Cyber... Security Maturity Model Certification. There you go. Well, before you move on to the next one, can I just stop you here? It's always fun to catch on to the language that's used. So this is a Microsoft Learn collection, and it's not a Microsoft Learn learning path, nor is it an individual Microsoft Learn module. It's a collection of modules. And collections are actually something that are available to anybody that are out there. I don't know if you've played with these at all. I have not played with these. So I use them internally to put together collections of modules and learning paths. Like they help with onboarding. Like, you know, I work in object storage. So object and data lake and kind of any protocols that sit on top of that NFS, SFTP, all those kinds of things. And when we onboard somebody new to storage, particularly on like the PM side of the house, those typically aren't engineers. So they're not folks who might be super deep in storage to begin with, particularly if you're somebody who's like new in career or your recent college graduate, something like that. I like to use collections as ways to put together kind of the latest and greatest versions of all the modules that we have out there that we, A, point our customers to, and B, we can also point them to, to get onboarded to storage in a quick way. And you could do that across any kind of set of services in Azure or really any set of content that's available within Microsoft Learn. So if you're in a position at your organization where you are the one who has to put together learning materials, you're trying to find fun and interesting ways to present those learning materials to people, maintain lists of them, make them durable, 
all those sorts of things. Learn collections are a pretty nifty way to do that if you've never checked them out. Got it. I will have to go look at actual the learned collections. And I realized I misspoke too. The short link goes to the CMC, CMMC overview. It does not go to the collection itself. So there's a different link that we'll put in the show notes to get to the collection itself. Too many links going all kinds of different places. But yeah, there's lots in there. I had not actually heard of collections before. Like I've always been familiar with the learning modules and the learning paths, but never actually looked at the collection aspect of it. Yeah, they're, they're actually like, <laughs> once you know they're there, you'll see that they're potentially used in all sorts of places, particularly like within product groups and documentation groups at Microsoft. Like there are some of us who embed custom learn collections in, directly into docs.microsoft.com. I've seen the networking folks do it. I think I've seen the AKS folks do it. I, I would actually love to do it for some of our storage documentation just to consolidate things a little bit better and have these customized learning paths that potentially fall outside of what you might learn as part of a certification or you might learn as a very targeted part of a service, but you can be cross-categorical and, and broad as you pull things together. So can anybody, like, can I go in and create my own collections of stuff too? I was just yeah. looking at... Yeah, so you just go to Microsoft Learn, you create a new collection from the homepage, and then from there you just start adding modules. If you want to you know, go back and edit your collection later, you can do that. Like It's almost like a folder of bookmarks, but it gets this nice presentation for it, which is kind of cool. Huh. I'm going to have to play with this. I don't see the collections page for me, but there's a chance it's me. Oh, I'm not in as my Office 365 account. Does it matter Microsoft account versus like a business account? Maybe. I don't know. I've only ever tried it through my org ID. All right. Yeah. And I just jumped over to it and I'm not signed in with my org ID. So there may be a caveat here. You may need to be signed in with an org ID to create a collection because I don't see how to create one based on the documentation with my MSA account. You're always left out. Sorry. I am. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees. They want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intelligent.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intelligent focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. You know what else I'm left out of, Scott? I'm left out of the new Outlook. <laughs> I went... You want to talk about really weird... I don't know, is it a PWA? Is it an Electron app? I don't know what it is anymore. I need to go look at an article. So this leaked like two or three weeks ago, I think. It was inadvertently shown. Some people got their hands on it. And then it kind of went away. And I think earlier this week, did it make its way out? Into the Wild about the new Outlook for Windows? Yes, it is currently available for customers who are, ooh, I'm going to get it right, uh, opted into the Office Insiders beta channel. Yes, and I apparently do not have my Windows account set up to be an Office Insider beta. And since I'm on a Mac, I don't always have Windows up in front of me. So I did not get the chance to play with this before we recorded today. But I have seen some, th some things. We were chatting about it a little bit. I went over to the website and looked at it. And I read the first four lines where it said multi-account in development, offline in development, account support for at outlook.com in development, and account support for Gmail, Yahoo, iCloud, and other IMAP accounts in development. And I said, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> the part about not having any com or VSTO objects, that wasn't the part that scared that you That was off. not the part that scared me off. Like my Outlook, 
I have like seven Office 365 accounts in it. And I do use offline. Those are actually the big two. Because truth be told, if I didn't have multi-accounts and I didn't care about offline, to your point earlier, I would just use a PWA or I would just use my browser and go to Outlook. Like To me, those are the two big things that still drive people to a desktop app and to not have them. I don't, I don't know. To me, it defeats the purpose. But I have not seen this. It sounds like you have seen this. I know other people have seen it. And it does, from what I've gleaned, it literally sounds like the web app wrapped in a desktop app. Like this is just a, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's like a PWA that's packaged up for you already. (laughs) Yeah, I don't, uh, you certainly go out and read the Microsoft documentation that they've released on it. It gives you kind of the details on what channels you need to be into, things like that to get access to it. I actually really liked that the article that The Verge did, where they kind of covered what was going on. There's certainly more screenshots in there that you can see to help you understand what it looks like. If you've ever used the I would say this, if you've ever used the Outlook client on Mac OS and you've come from the Outlook client on Windows, all of a sudden you go like, whoa, I'm in this strange new world. If you are somebody who uses the Outlook client on Mac OS today, you would probably be pretty darn comfortable in what this new Outlook client looks like on Windows. It's very similar in kind of look, feel, from what I've seen, kind of form and function too. You know, I've gotten used to things in like the Outlook client for Mac OS where some things are just external (laughs) to the (laughs) client, like you want to use to-do. Great, you're going to click a button to go to to to-do and it's not native and built into the app. It's just going to open up the website and it seems like the new Outlook is going to do that as well, at least for the foreseeable future. Do you know what this kind of reminds me of when I'm looking at the screenshots on The Verge? is the Office 365 app for mobile. It's in the sense of it's like, because I'm looking at it and I see all the links down the left side. I can, there's the link for the email, for calendar, for context, but then you have to do Word, Excel, and PowerPoint down the side there. And it's like, so are we just going to this, essentially a PWA, like let's just wrap all the web apps into a frame, maybe similar to Electron. And let's call it the Office 365 app. And as you click through the different things, whether you want to do email or Word or Outlook or PowerPoint, we're just going to surface those web pages in this new desktop Outlook app that looks like it could actually turn into a desktop all things Office 365 app. Yes, arguably better integrated. So there's always been one-offs in Outlook for Windows that didn't exist in other places. And it's been getting better over time. So uh, maybe like a one example that's top of mind for me there is flagging items in Outlook. So if you are a heavy user of flagging and setting due dates for follow-ups for emails in Outlook using flags... Stuff like that used to be totally disconnected. It was an Outlook only feature and, you know, arguably like more of a power user feature in Outlook. And over time, things like that have started to be connected maybe to to do, planner, things like that to kind of integrate it better into the ecosystem. Yeah, that would be good. I have been wanting better integration for certain things. I don't know that I was quite envisioning this. I am curious how they're going to pull off certain things in here. Like, multi-user accounts. I can see offline, okay, essentially let's just cache all of this somehow or... I mean, offline seems fairly easy to figure out because some of the PWAs can already do some offline stuff. I think Outlook on the web has been able to do some sort of offline stuff now for a while with caching. But if you're bringing up the whole web interface, like is multi-account support going to be the new fast account switching that they are bringing to the web. And that's why they don't have it in the desktop app yet is they need that to come to the web first and then they can bring it to the desktop app. Or are they going to somehow be able to accomplish like this being a web app, but somehow adding other email addresses into it? The benefit I get 
from multiple accounts in Outlook is that I can click on view all my inboxes and I can see every email across all my inboxes and sort through them. I don't have to flip between seven different accounts or being able to do calendar overlays across all of those different accounts. I'm curious to see how that surfaces itself based on what we've seen so far with this new app. Yeah, I don't know how they put that genie back in the bottle, uh, just considering what Outlook does today. And not just Outlook on the desktop, but Outlook across platforms. So, you know, Outlook on the desktop, on Windows, Mac OS, Outlook on mobile, on iOS and Android, you have the ability to add IMAP accounts, you can add Gmail accounts, all those kinds of things. Like that would be really hard to take away in the desktop app and then still have those features available within the mobile clients and, and things like that. So I tend to want to wear like the rosy colored glasses there where, hey, multi account is multi account in the sense that it's multiple disparate systems that can be pulled into a single view. And I think it'd be great. Like if they can pull that off and have like a modern unified desk, a modern unified inbox on Outlook for Windows, that's awesome. That's all upside to me. Right. Well, and I would love like for a while I've thought about it. Like why couldn't you in theory even do that with Outlook on the web? Arguably, you'd still have to have like a primary account that you would log into to get to Outlook on the web, but then go in and add other email accounts to Outlook on the web, just like you do on Outlook on the desktop, where it's, I want to go sign into this. Like, turn the web-based Outlook into something like the desktop where you can add multiple accounts to it, and it's just a thin, essentially like a thin web-based client. I'm not a developer. It very well may be a whole lot easier for me to say it than it is to do it. But I feel like... (laughs) You might make a good PM. I probably would. (laughs) But it feels like that's something that could be accomplished. And I think... Does Gmail do that? Have I seen that Gmail? I feel like I've seen it other places where like you can add multiple Gmail accounts to a single Gmail inbox and have and work with all your email there. Or I might just be making stuff up. I don't know. I haven't tried that in Gmail, but I think you're making that one up. Okay. Like usually, I'm f- I'm forwarding emails around and then doing like send aliases and things like that for Gmail <laughs> still. That. Yeah, this will be interesting to see. Be interesting to see what happens with this one. Anything else on the new Outlook? No. No. I, I mean, I think that was about it for my end. I don't have anything else on Outlook. Did you see Viva Goals? Have you had a chance to look at that one yet? <laughs> Uh, I saw it. I haven't used it. Something, something OKRs. And I kind of blacked out along the way. (laughs) That's about what I saw. I was like, oh, now I get to go set goals for me and see how far behind I am on all my goals. It's not available yet. So there's some videos out there. You can go read some articles about it. Where did I see... I think it's coming later this year. They had a date in this article somewhere. I can't find it right now. So it was announced, or it was announced, was essentially the extent of Viva goals. But it looks like a way to, I don't know, set up goals. Maybe it's work with your manager to set up goals and then track those throughout the course of a year or a quarter? Well, so, no. (laughs) It's not necessarily individual goal setting. It's really a goal setting solution for an entire organization and the teams within those organizations, specifically aligned around OKRs or objectives and key results. That wonderful system that... eh, everybody uses, including Microsoft. So it's a way to take the OKR framework and then map that back into Viva Goals as a way to manage and track progress against those objectives and their key results over time. What if I'm a team of one? I don't know how well OKRs will work for you, but... You know, the world is your oyster. And this all came out of an acquisition. Is that Alio? Is that how you're supposed to say it? Is Alio? It's Ali, Ally, A L L Y dot I O. However, you choose to pronounce that. I missed that Microsoft acquired them, but apparently that was OKR software that turns your goals into results as their tagline. But they were acquired, and that is what has become 
Viva Goals. So if you use that in the past, you should be familiar with Viva Goals. It'll just be a part of Teams now instead of a standalone application. Indeed. Oh, anything else, Scott? Anybody have anything in the chat? The chat's been quiet today. No, I think that's about it. No, kind of a yeah, little slower week. I don't have anything else either. So I can let you go. We can, I don't know how short, long we are, but we can wrap this one up and go enjoy our weekends. Sounds like a plan. All right. Thanks, Scott. And we will talk to you next week to cover all the build stuff, or at least the build stuff that I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that little bit of post-build madness, yeah. Yeah, I saw the IT Pro's Guide to Build, and it has like, well, it has a few sessions in it, but it is not, there's usually a little <laughs> Two stuff. Two things on it? Yeah, <laughs> and say there's usually a few things, like a handful of IT Pro stuff, but it is not one that I get as excited about as Ignite. Yeah, Ignite 2 will be coming up. But yeah, we'll see what comes out of build and what we can chat about after that. All but right. In the meantime, uh, if you're listening to this today and you have a question you'd like to ask for us to answer in a future episode, you can always reach out to us on Twitter. We're just at MS Cloud IT Pro, or you can reach us through the MS Cloud IT Pro members Discord, where you, which you can get access to by signing up for a monthly membership. A monthly membership gives you access to Discord for chatting and participating in the show as it's recorded each week. You'll also get access to our To the Cloud streams on YouTube, where you can dive into configuring and using features and services across Azure and Microsoft 365. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about membership or signing up, go to msclouditpro.com forward slash membership. And thank you so much to everyone who has supported the show so far. And as always, thanks to our sponsor this week, IntelliJink. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day. 